Yep. Good afternoon. Welcome to Conversation at Noon. On behalf of the Connecticut Democracy Center, I'm very pleased to welcome you to Connecticut's Old State House for the second in a three-part series, Census 2020, Count Me In. We would like to thank Connecticut Humanities for its financial support of this program series, which is hosted in partnership with the Office of the Lieutenant Governor and the Office of the Secretary of the State. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Mariana Garcia, for her assistance with this program. During today's program, we invite you to post your comments and questions underneath the live Facebook feed. We will be giving these questions to panelists during the program. Also in that same area, please look for a link to a brief survey about today's program. We appreciate you filling out a survey. It helps us plan future programs. Today's program follows up on the earlier one that introduced this year's 2020 census. Today's program is really focused on the data that is collected from the census. Who utilizes this data and how is it used? To start off, we're very, very pleased to be able to welcome Connecticut's Secretary of the State, Denise Merrill, to speak for a few minutes. Secretary Merrill was elected to her third term as Connecticut's 73rd Secretary of the State on November 6, 2018. As Connecticut's chief elections official and business register, Merrill has focused on modernizing Connecticut's elections, business services, and improving access to public records. We really appreciate her joining us during this very busy time of year. She graduated from the University of Connecticut. Prior to her service as Secretary of the State, Secretary Merrill served as state representative from this 54th General Assembly District for 17 years representing the towns of Mansfield and Chaplin. Merrill rose to the rank of House Majority Leader from 2009 to 2011, rather. She also served as the House Chair of the Budget Writing Appropriations Committee from 2005 to 2009. 
as vice chair of the Education Committee from 1994 to 1999, and as a member of the Government Administration and Elections Committee from 1995 to 1997. Welcome, Secretary Merrill. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me today to talk about what I think is probably one of the most important civic duties that anyone on this call will perform this year. And what do you suppose that is? Most of the time, knowing who I am, you would think that might be voting in the upcoming election. But actually, it's not. It's about something that has importance that will extend beyond even the presidential term for the next decade. And that was that is the U.S. Census and your need to be counted in this U.S. sentence and what it means. This is something that's going to impact us in this state and every state in the country for decades to come. And it matters to you, to me, and to everyone living in the country, but especially for our discussion today, people living in the state of Connecticut. The U.S. Census has been held in this country every 10 years since 1790. And that's because the founding fathers clearly understood that knowing how many people are living in which states and which communities was critical information to the functioning of the then new country. The census has helped us become the successful country we have been for those couple hundred years now. As the country grew and changed, it enabled policymakers to determine how they could best serve economic and social growth. And I think in some ways, 2020 might be the most important measure yet. Why? Well, the U.S. is much more diverse than it ever has been. The census helps us understand who exactly lives where and what their lives look like. And it's data that's collected on every person, and that's important in this context, and I'm sure others will discuss that. Not just citizens, every person living in this country to understand what kinds of support they need, whether it's through government programs or through nonprofits and other organization. It helps us understand who's living in our country and their profiles. That profile of the people in our country it use, is used for thousands of things and literally for the distribution of hundreds of billions of dollars. Yes, B with a B. Uh, in federal funding allocated to hundreds of programs that help ordinary people. Everything from Medicaid, Head Start, block grants for community health services, and the supplemental nutrition, the SNAP uh, program, all these things that help our citizens and our people in this country are distributed under, under the data that's collected by the U.S. Census. That's why it is so critical that every person in our state is counted. So to this end, uh, we in Connecticut planned far in advance for this. Um, we created what we call a complete count committee at the state level. It's chaired by Lieutenant Governor Susan Beisowitz and I am co-chair along with uh, State Representative Chris Rosario from Bridgeport and State Representative Pat Wilson Phineas uh, from Eastern Connecticut and they are the co-chairs. We have collectively visited every community in this state carrying the message that everyone needs to work together to make sure that every single person is part of the census count. Uh, to this date, after we called on all these local governments and enlisted community activists, community health centers, government officials, chambers of commerce, leaders in communities of all kinds to come together and create their own complete count committees. And to date, we have over 100 communities have formed these committees. They have been busy over the past almost year now, making sure that members of their community are counted. Uh, and everything was going along very, very well until about March when along came COVID. And that severely restricted our ability to reach out, particularly in hard to count communities. Um, and the restrictions that were put in place due to, the, due to the fear of spread of the virus meant that it became much more difficult to do house to house visits, for example, in such communities. So this dramatic change was recognized. The timelines have been changed. Uh, so we still have time and you still have time to be part of this movement that is so critical for our state. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We have some experts on the panel who will tell you exactly how this count will impact you, 
your community and everyone in our country in terms of the kinds of programs that are used, where the, the, the data is used to, uh, to used when they're talking about distribution of federal funds. And also, of course, the reason I'm involved is because it is also about the distribution of political power in the country. Uh, it will determine congressional representation, inform uh, which districts are where in our state and in our country. And in the past, uh, in different periods of time, we have lost seats in Congress based on the count in our community. Uh, we don't want that to happen again because it's critically important that we maintain our political power in Congress, especially now when there is so much contention over all kinds of issues that impact us dramatically. So uh, thanks for tuning in. I think you will enjoy the conversation and learn a lot about what the US Census means to all of us. Thank you so much for having me. And let's hope we get every single person in this state counted in the census this year. Thanks. Thank you so much, Secretary Merrill, for joining us. We really appreciate it. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's program. We're delighted to be joined by Diane Smith, a longtime friend of uh, Connecticut's old state house. Diane is a New York Times bestselling author, an Emmy award-winning journalist, documentary producer, and speaker. Diane has been on the air in Connecticut for more than 25 years at WTNH TV, CPTV, WTIC News Talk 1080, and the Connecticut Network. She is currently a distinguished lecturer at the University of New Haven. She was inducted into the Connecticut Journalism Hall of Fame at the National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences Silver Circle for 25 years of Connecticut, excuse me, of distinguished service to broadcasting and the community. She is truly one of Connecticut's treasures, and we are pleased to welcome her today. Rebecca, thank you so much. And uh, as Denise Merrill said, every 10 years, the federal government does require, uh, it is required actually by the Constitution to conduct this thorough and detailed count of every resident of the United States. Uh, recently, an editorial in the New York Times put it this way. It said, it's hard to overstate the importance of the census to everyday life in the United States. The vast amount of demographic information it gathers determines who gets how much political power in Congress and the states. It steers more than a trillion dollars in federal funding for healthcare and other critical services. It guides long-term economic decisions by governments, corporations, and mom and pop stores. It helps determine the location of highways and schools, hospitals and housing, police and fire stations. And as uh, the secretary mentioned, the census count, like everything else this year, was impacted by the pandemic. So although this year did have the highest ever participation online, enumerators were, as she said, delayed in their door-to-door -door data collection. They do that for people that have not responded online or by mail or by telephone. There were several attempts to try to wrap up uh, the schedule a little bit earlier than it had been anticipated. There has been some back and forth on that. And as we go on the air today, there was a federal judge in California who has issued an order uh, a couple of days ago saying that the census count must continue until the end of October. Uh, just on Monday night, uh, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross uh, announced that the census uh, enumeration will end on October 5th. And uh, there are a number of parties who are seeking to overturn that, uh, the National Urban League, uh, various advocacy groups, cities, counties, other municipalities. So uh, the fight is going on in court right now. There is a contempt charge against the Trump administration and uh, they're invited to respond to that uh, today uh, by midday Pacific time. So clearly this is a really important topic. And let me discuss uh, now introduce the people that are going to be discussing this with us. Keith Faniff is the state finance reporter for the Connecticut Mirror. Quite simply, most of us just know Keith as the state budget guru. Keith has been Connecticut Mirror's state finances reporter since the Mirror launched in 2010. And Keith has spent most of his 30 years as a reporter specializing in state government finances, analyzing topics such as income tax equity, waste in government, and the complex funding systems behind Connecticut's transportation and social services network. I'm also very happy to welcome John Carl Casa. In 2016, John Carl became the very first president and CEO of the Connecticut Nonprofit Alliance. Before that, he served for five and a half years as undersecretary for legislative affairs at the state's Office of Policy and Management. 
At OPM, he was responsible for budget-related and other legislation and managed requests for state bond funding and worked closely with the governor's office. Before joining the Malloy administration, he worked for more than two decades at the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. So as you can see, um, he has been uh, an observer of how important the census data is on three very different levels. Also joining us is State Representative Brandon McGee. He is serving his fourth term, representing the people of Windsor and Hartford, and is a former candidate for mayor of Hartford. Uh, Representative McGee is the chairman of the legislature's housing committee and chairman of the Black and Puerto Rican caucus. He's a Hartford native and he has devoted his life to public service starting very early in his career after he was inspired by Rosa Parks, of course, one of the most influential figures of the civil rights movement. He's an advocate for equity in education, criminal justice reform, voter registration, and empowerment for people of color and their communities. And Mr. McGee, I'm gonna start with you because that last line in your biography about empowerment for people of color and their communities, part of that does depend on those people being accurately counted in the census, does it not? Diane, thank you so much uh, for that warm introduction. Uh, and I, I think that's a great segue <clears throat> into uh, my remarks in, re in regards to uh, some of the more hard to count areas. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I really wanted to hone in on is we know that, you know, when young children are not counted, um, support for programs such as health insurance, hospitals, child care, food assistance, schools, and early childhood development is impacted because the more children there are, the greater the needs are or is. Uh, and as a father of two, I want to take this time to stress the importance of this segment of our population. Uh, we know that 1 million children were undercounted in the 2010 census. Those undercounted are primarily aged uh, from newborn to about five years old, and an age group that saw the highest undercount rate out of any other age group. Uh, we also know that a disproportionate number of those undercounted make up minority communities in the US, United States. Uh, and we know that when our communities aren't counted, we miss out on cr critical or crucial supports from the federal government. Uh, so the US Census Bureau recently released a set of estimates uh, showing that 50.4% um, of our nation's population younger than age one were minorities um, as of July 1, 2011. Mm -hmm. Young children who are often undercounted come from backgrounds or living situations that include foster families, multiple families, people who are not related to them, grandparents, single parents, young adults, uh, individuals with limited ability to speak English, renters or people who have moved, um, uh, parents or guardians with lower incomes or without a permanent home. So more close to home, it's been widely reported that Hartford has the lowest response rate in the nation. And with alongside my colleagues in Hartford, um, we must work to change that in very <laughs> short order. Yes, and Representative, um, it, you know, Connecticut had one of the highest response rates in the Northeast, but Hartford and several other cities, including right. Newport and Waterbury, uh, were severely behind that. That's and right. so uh, it turns out that something like one in five Connecticut residents live in areas that are considered hard to count areas. Besides those factors that you mentioned about uh, that relate specifically to children, about renters, about families who move, what are the other factors that make those areas hard to count? Does it have to do also with um, the internet? Does it have to do with uh, low home ownership so that people are moving more frequently or what is it? Um, that's a very loaded question and I'd love to have a conversation on all of those barriers. Uh, but I, I think this pandemic, um, as we already know, highlighted all of the disparities mm -hmm. and the disproportionate impact on many of the communities that I just described. Mm -hmm. So of course, connectivity is an issue. Uh, frequent moving in terms of folks who are unfortunately unable to make their rent payments and they're moving from home to home. Uh, so we know, we all know on this call uh, that the pandemic has created barriers to entry unlike any other experienced in the past century of mm -hmm. counts. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, I'll end on this. We must really treat the coming days with a heightened level of urgency. Our mm -hmm. state, 
our communities. We must be counted so that we can be heard. And unfortunately, um, trying to gain access to many of these communities that I represent, it's been difficult, especially with number 45 spewing out these negative, uh, very fearful tactics. Uh, folks are not really interested in, 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 in participating in the census, but it's our job to ensure that they understand the importance of being counted. And I, will, I just want to ask you one more question, and that is that earlier uh, in the census uh, enumeration, or just before it started, there was a move by the president to try to include a question about citizenship. Yeah. That was struck down. But I still think that perhaps a lot of people who are not citizens but are permanent residents are fearful of answering the census because they're concerned about where that information goes. That's right. I mean, you said it. I, 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 you said it best. Uh, folks are just fearful. Uh, families are holding on uh, to their life and they're afraid that ISIS might show up or, mm -hmm. you know, some law official might come and take the husband or the children, et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. And even those who are citizens. They're fearful. And I've had a conversation with many of them in my district uh, who are citizens, uh, but they just don't feel comfortable sharing any information or even talking to the numerators. Yeah, I should say, and I want to move on to another um, panelist, but I will say that uh, federal law guarantees that that information remains uh, totally private That's and right. that it can only be used for demographic purposes by the census and that actually people who work for the census take a vow. They have to sign a vow saying that they will never release any of that information uh, to right. anyone other than the actual um, Census Bureau, which I think is really interesting. Um, Keith, uh, you talked a bit to me uh, prior to this about how there's about a billion, about $1.5 trillion that's doled out to the states based on formulas rooted in the census. And what you were saying is that a lot of this money goes to what we would call the backbone of the safety net. So that's critical for a lot of programs. Yeah, I mean, when you just talk about the numbers, things stand out just on that. We could talk about our Medicaid program, which is about 30% of our budget. That's all gonna depend upon the census. And, and it's important to keep in mind because Connecticut is a wealthy state, we are what, what some would call a donor state. We get 74 cents back from Washington for every dollar in income taxes, federal income taxes that we pay. So when we undercount, we are, um, we are weakening a system that's already, I don't want to say skewed against us because there's a reason we get less, but it's already counted against us. Um, in addition, when we're talking Medicaid, we're talking now about nursing homes, we're talking about hospitals, talking about money um, for doctors, for any care providers who treat the sick, um, uh, health clinics. We're talking about a lot of our nonprofit providers who treat uh, people with disabilities. A lot of them um, are, are reimbursed with Medicaid dollars. And, and one other point on this, Diane, I just wanted to make is that without this money, we also really can't always appreciate how bad the gaps are in Connecticut. So much of the studies you'll get that will show um, whether it's a gap in education or a gap in healthcare or a gap in earnings, the backbone of all of that is census data. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you just you lead me perfectly into a question to John Carl Casa, because John Carl, you've seen the issue of the federal dollars coming to the state from three viewpoints: the state, uh, local municipalities, and nonprofits. Let's first talk a little bit about the nonprofits, because Keith mentioned that so many of the services that are provided in our state, uh, social services, are actually provided by nonprofits that are being reimbursed by state and federal dollars. How concerned are you about the nonprofits in your alliance? at what is happening right now? Well, we're very concerned because uh, nonprofits along with state and local government are about serving the people of Connecticut. And all of that is tied together with the census and how much money the census brings into the state. If we don't have, uh, if there's an undercount and we get fewer congressional members, then uh, we actually deserve, we'll have less clout in Congress. If we have less clout in Congress, um, we will get less revenue into the state of Connecticut. That means less revenue for local government. It means less revenue for nonprofits. And it means pressure on all of those entities then to serve people because the need doesn't go away. The need is going to be there. And we need to know where the need is if we're going to make sure people get services. So while it seems a little bit circuitous or seems like a long road, 
there really is a direct line between responses to the census and the ability of the state, local governments, and nonprofits to provide services. And how has COVID impacted that, uh, the, the nonprofits and the census data that's being collected? You know, when this started, one of the things we wanted to do was uh, use the trust that nonprofits have uh, with the people that they serve and have them do a lot of the outreach. You know, when my grandparents were immigrants and they had a different view of government, if somebody from the government came to the door back then, they would answer the questions because the government had been on their side. There's a distrust of government right now. Uh, but there is not a distrust of nonprofits. And so our hope coming into this year was that we could use nonprofits to do outreach into communities that might otherwise be undercounted. When COVID hit, it stopped people from coming into nonprofits, it cut down on the workforce, it put, put work pressures on nonprofits. So they weren't able to do the concentrated kind of work um, in pushing census response that we had hoped they would be able to do. COVID really just cleared the table of everything else. Mm, interesting. I hadn't thought about that part of it. Um, Representative McGee, um, you're also the head of the uh, housing committee uh, in the uh, state legislature. And so a lot of the data that comes in has to affect how we plan for housing in the state, how we plan for both public housing, how we plan for um, uh, zoning in communities, where to put uh, different types of cluster housing. It affects things like even heating assistance. So what's your concern now about that area that may be impacted? Yeah, you know, that, that's a really great question, Diane, and I appreciate you asking that question. Also, if you hear some background noise, I'm here at the uh, legislative office building. We have special sessions, so I'm competing with, uh, with, with the background noise. Uh, but to answer your question directly, um, it's, it's been a great deal of stress um, uh, on me. Uh, I can only imagine the stress on those families who are, uh, have fallen on, on really hard times with respect to, you know, housing. Uh, and the basic essentials that some of us might take it take advantage or maybe not advantage, but we don't really think about it because we're so fortunate uh, where we are. Uh, but we have to be mindful of, of planning for the future and even meeting the immediate needs of those individuals um, who are in need of support. And just hearing from um, the Alliance there, uh, it's important that we have those agencies who understand the culture the language uh, and perhaps even the relationships to uh, continue helping those families where they are. Uh, but I got to tell you, the state of Connecticut, we've got a long way to go when you talk about housing, uh, when you talk about addressing redlining uh, that's impacted this, this state uh, for decades uh, and really providing individuals who have been disproportionately impacted by the lack of supports and resources We've really got a lot of work to do. So I'm not sure if I answered your question in totality, mm -hmm. but I just know that um, there's not a silver sort of bullet uh, yeah. to, 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 you know, answer yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Really absolutely. Kidding. I understand that. Um, let's talk about a kind of a related issue. And Keith, I want to start with you. And that is, um, we're not just talking about social services programs. We're also talking about education, both at the public school level and at the higher education level. Um, talk to me a little bit about how the census plays into uh, at the public school level. Okay. Uh, well, the first and easiest way would probably be transportation. Um, just not necessarily the biggest dollars, but something everybody can relate to. Um, that is one of the areas that districts rely on federal funding. That's all tied to the census, but also one of the biggest problems district faces, districts face uh, special education. And that's because um, depending on a, a particular student's challenges, the expenses can really vary from year to year significantly. Um, that also is tied to the census. In fact, special education has been such a, a problem that every so often the legislature will sort of play around with the idea, does the state need to start to take on some of these costs because uh, municipalities end up end up eating a lot of that. Um, when you get to higher ed, it's, it's vital and it's really almost measured at the household level because the census is the key to so many student aid programs, particularly the Pell Grants. They're, they're all based on 
census data. We have an initiative in Connecticut that we're trying to hold on to, to allow people to graduate debt-free from community colleges. That entire system is built basically around Pell Grants. In other words, if community college students can receive enough federal aid and pay in, the community, co community college system will actually have enough resources to help those students who perhaps don't even get enough financial aid. Again, all of that hinges on the census. Mm -hmm. And um, Brandon, I, I would assume that you see a lot of that, particularly in um, communities where there are first generation college students, uh, college students who are non-traditional college students who are trying to either um, uh, retrain for new uh, careers. I see a lot of it. I teach at the University of New Haven. We have quite a few uh, first generation students who are really relying on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, as the first um, person in my family uh, to, to graduate from college, we relied heavily on uh, transportation. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately, I got a really uh, great scholarship and I went to school in Alabama, Alabama State University. Uh, but even there, uh, folks, you know, they taught the importance of being counted so that we uh, could receive those appropriate funds uh, to support uh, transportation to and from school. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask uh, John Carl about a little bit about education, because there are so many disparities in education um, it, based on lots of things in, in Connecticut. I mean, there are disparities among the wealthy and the wealthy communities and the communities that, are, that don't have that kind of wealth. Where are nonprofits helping to kind of make up the gap between those two things? Where are they called upon? Nonprofits are frequently uh, called upon to make up, make up the gap in a lot of areas. Um, government can't do it all, including education. Um, and nonprofits are there to, to help folks in their communities provide for the needs in those communities. You, know, you think of, um, if you think of nonprofits, you can think of them as a type of business and businesses go where the markets are. Uh, nonprofits go where the needs are. If they don't know where those needs are, they won't know where to make investments. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same for government. And that all comes back to knowing where people are, knowing which people are where, and, and thinking about how you can best serve them. John Carl, I remember, um, you know, when you were uh, with the Office of Policy and Management and every year you would, um, or every two years, you would present the state budget um, on budget day. And, and it was always a very big and complicated deal that probably only you and Keith really understood 100 percent of. But tell me from the perspective of the state when you were doing that, how much were you building in? Um, federal funding into everything that you were planning for? Were there programs that you had to anticipate would be completely wiped out without the ability of federal funding? And not just social services programs, but, you know, uh, things like transportation, uh, things that are generally bonded for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Keith talked Keith talked earlier about the Medicaid program. Certainly when the state's considering how to put money into a program like Medicaid, they think about what the, what the net effect is going to be on the state budget. Something might cost a million dollars, but you're going to get 50% back from the state government. Well, you can do something more or something different mm -hmm. if you know what you're getting back from, from the feds. Interesting. Also, um, you know, a big topic that's been going on now for, through several administrations has been a discussion of how we're going to fund our transit and our highway projects. And there's big debate, of course, over highway tolls. And right now we don't have any. So, Keith, how does a state that doesn't have highway tolls um, depend upon federal funding for projects that involve both transit and highway planning? Yeah, the, the short answer is how do we depend enormously? Um, Right now in Connecticut, uh, we basically pay for our road and bridge uh, and um, rail upgrades with just two pots of money. It, it's, it's basically that we borrow about $800 million a year and we pay that off with our gasoline taxes. We're, we're I don't wanna say stealing, we're shaving money off the sales tax um, to pay just the principal and interest every year on that. We need to borrow that money because that in turn leverages about 750 or almost the same amount in matching federal grants. That is almost our entire, or has been, I should say, for much of the last decade, our entire capital system. 
We're trying to ramp that up right now without tolls. Um, and I don't want to get too much into whether we should or shouldn't have tolls. Mm -hmm. But I will say without some long-term source, that, that system is not going to be sustainable. And now there's already there are already fears that Congress may want to um, uh, not expand or maybe, maybe even pull back on federal transportation aid. That, again, just highlights the importance of the census, because if for some reason our federal aid starts to go down because our census is poor or because of Congress, then we're already in a much, much more difficult situation than, than we're already in right now. Uh, John Carl, let me ask you again, when you were a uh, part of the Malloy administration and working in OPM, um, how much did the uh, desire to attract federal funds for highway projects and transit projects like our railroads, et cetera, um, how much did that impact the whole discussion on highway tolls? Well, we didn't, um, we didn't propose tolls mm -hmm. at the time, mm -hmm. um, but it does have an impact on every aspect of the state budget because mm -hmm. it determines uh, how much you can afford to uh, put into any particular program or line item. You know, one of the things to talk about the state budget is the state distributes monies to municipalities uh, by a variety of formulas. Uh, the local capital improvement program um, is, it uses population mm -hmm. in its formula. The mm -hmm. education cost sharing uh, formula does in a very complicated way mm -hmm. uh, that, that only Keith understands. Um, <laughs> that, that, um, and you know, pro school construction grants, you mentioned school construction um, earlier, mm -hmm. that has a population factor in it. Um, so on program after program after program, the census has an impact either because it's a way to distribute money to, to cities and towns or to nonprofits, but also uh, because of the way it makes state programs affordable or not affordable, depending on how much they're getting from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And let me just ask you one more question about that, because I want to uh, remind people that uh, you did spend a number of years at the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, so uh, representing cities and towns in the state. Um, they are so dependent on these funds and yet have really no control over how they get them or whether they get them. Well, they, you know, they again, they come up to the state and they lobby the state for um, assistance for funding that'll that'll keep pressure off property taxes. Mm -hmm. So it all goes back to the amount of representation Connecticut has in Congress and the mm -hmm. amount of funding that that representation can bring back to the state. Um, one of the things that uh, municipalities use um, census data for is to develop its plans of development. Uh, so it knows where, for instance, as an example, where to put sewers. Mm -hmm. And so then they take that local plan and they put, they they build it into a regional plan. That mm -hmm. regional plan gets built into a state plan. And when a state starts talking about how much funding for, again, sewers as an example, um, it, it ties directly into what that plan of conservation and development set at the local level. And that is determined uh, to a certain degree a fair degree by what the population expectations are for that community. Mm -hmm. And Keith, I imagine that that also um, affects where do we decide to put in roads? Where do we decide that we're going to create, you know, bus lanes and different types of transit situations? It's all really dependent on where is our population going to be living in the next, you know, where has it been in 10 years? Where are we projecting in the next 10? Well, where is our population going in? And where are different segments of our population going? I was thinking, Diane, uh, of uh, some points that uh, Brandon had talked upon earlier, um, but like census data provides us sometimes with some very uncomfortable but very important information. And it's particularly important in Connecticut because we have such extremes of, of income and wealth in this state. Uh, some studies say that the nation is the most income has the largest income, uh, greatest income inequality, excuse me, since World War II. Others say since the stock market crash of 1929. But to give you some idea, generally the top 1% in this country make 24 times what the bottom 99% average. And there are a lot of very wealthy people in the bottom 99%. In Connecticut, that ratio is about 43 to one. In Fairfield County, it's 74 to one. We have some huge disparities, so things can look 
perfectly fine when you're looking at the median or the average, but then you'll get to certain parts of Connecticut. And if, 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 you're, if you're not digging down into the data, um, you're not really recognizing the need there. And, and I'm, I'm kind of taking this argument around, but I'm also, when I think about the nonprofits, um, you were asking earlier about what, how, you know, how, how do the nonprofits go where the need is? How, where do they go? To give you some idea of the scope of our nonprofit social services network that works with the state government, that gets contracts from the state to go where the need is. If you were to add up all the money we spend on these nonprofits, it'd be bigger than the DMV, the Department of Transportation, and the prison system combined. Wow. That's how extensive the need may be. So while I'm not trying to pick on any one part of the state, perhaps the need isn't extensive in Fairfield County outside of Bridgeport and Norwalk. Um, you go into certain areas and the need is huge. And it's the same, it's the same with certain areas of Connecticut with transportation. We just have a lot of extremes. Um, I would argue in a certain ways that data is more important here than most other states. And, and all of that goes back to the census. Really interesting, um, really interesting point. Uh, Brandon, um, I know that, you know, several of the other members of your caucus are representing Waterbury, they're representing Bridgeport. So um, do you think that the caucus as a whole is as aware of um, how important the census data is for all of the various things that go on for their populations as maybe they should be? Absolutely. Uh, my caucus is very um, keen on the importance of the census. Um, and, you know, I would be remiss if I just if I didn't raise the voice um, or the voices of the under uh, served and represented. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, we were talking about transportation. That's important. Uh, we're talking about the state budget. That's important. Uh, but when we begin talking about the importance of the census, we miss a segment of our community that's black and brown people uh, uh, as a part of this overall conversation. Mm -hmm. Housing is important. Jobs are important. Mm -hmm. The types of communities that we live in are important. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, oftentimes, these types of challenges and concerns that the folks we represent, whether it's Waterbury, Bridgeport, or Hartford, they're not a part of the overall conversation. conversation. Mm -hmm as we continue to move forward. So, you know, I, I think this is a great conversation, especially mm -hmm. because a lot of my people don't trust the system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not talking about anything that is remotely uh, a part of their everyday concern. And, mm -hmm. and all we're saying is be counted, be counted. Mm -hmm. And then one might ask, well, why? Because mm -hmm. I don't see the money coming to my community. Mm -hmm. And my response to that is we need to be counted and we need to speak up and speak out and hold all of the agencies, whether it's state or nonprofit, uh, hold folks accountable. So I would say, yes, we're, we're, we're highly informed and we understand the importance of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you can imagine, there are some challenges trying to uh, get the message out to many of our constituents. Yeah, and I think about, you know, other things that impact um, uh, all sorts of people, and that is, you know, federal regulation of things like home mortgages. You mentioned redlining right. previously. Uh, things like uh, regulation of small business loans. Uh, who gets them? Who's, you know, how do you start a small business in Hartford or Windsor or wherever? Um, you know, what if you're a micro business? How do you get money for that? Equal employment practices. All of that is impacted by knowing what the population is, where they are, and who they are. Right, Brandon? Oh, absolutely. I, I didn't know if that was a question or yeah, not. Yeah, I was never really, but yeah. <laughs> no, trust me, I agree. And yeah. um, you know, I'm 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 known to really talk about the importance of reinvesting uh, in communities that we've not invested in in a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and until we we do that, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of folk sort of stepping back and saying, why? Why am I doing this again? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I hear you people at the top level, you, mm -hmm. you politicians talk about the importance of this, but I'm not actually seeing this happen mm -hmm. on the local level. So, mm -hmm. you know, like I tell folks in regards to, you know, voting, mm -hmm. if you're not voting, then you're not at the table. And mm -hmm. so you have to be counted so that, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, when we talk about our conservation plans and or the 10 year plans that determine yeah. what happens in municipalities, We've got to speak up and speak out. Yeah, um, um, Keith is raising the issue of transit again because one of the things that the census helps determine is where is the potential workforce? Where is the workforce and where is the potential workforce? And now how do we get people to where the jobs are, right, Keith? A great point. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree, Diane. And I think there's, there's a little bit of confusion that some people think uh, because of the pandemic, and I'm certainly not making light of it, um, that the need for transit is over. Um, that some people, are, you know, how folks are saying, well, everyone's going to be commuting from home going forward, or there's going to be a lot more of that. And, and while I think there will be on some level, I want to just remind people of a few things. Um, Connecticut, over the last decade, grew more jobs in the retail and the service area and the hospitality area than anywhere else. Well, we wish we had grown some more higher paying jobs, but the fact is that's where a lot of people had to turn to find work. That's why we're looking at an effective unemployment rate now of 15%. What does that all tie in with transit? Right now, transit costs are about 25% of the budget special transportation fund. The biggest expense is still paying the interest and principal on all that borrowing we use to make the repairs. We also have to run the DOT and pay the staff. But the fastest growing part of their budget is transit. And it's not all going into uh, subsidizing train rides on Metro North into New York City a huge part of it are the buses that get people in the, the greater Hartford area, the greater New Haven area, and the greater uh, Bridgeport area, and even in some of our smaller urban centers to jobs. And unfortunately, coming out of this recession, and we don't know exactly when that's going to be, there's still probably going to be a limited growth in high-end jobs, which means a lot of people, even if they would prefer not to, are going to need to have to get back on buses. Um, again, all of this state funding in that area hinges on hinges on uh, census data, good census data. And you know, Keith, my concern about those areas of growth in the economy in Connecticut that you mentioned is that they have all been so impacted by COVID, and they may continue to be for quite some time. Uh, hospitality, uh, we have hotels that are you know closing, going up for sale. We have uh, you know people in the service industry. Um, I live in Norwalk. They just opened a brand new gigantic mall in Norwalk, and you know, it's it's half open um, because people aren't going to shop in malls. They're not they're shopping online. COVID has impacted so much of how life is lived uh, that I worry about those sectors of the economy that those jobs may not come back when COVID ends. That's a really good point, Diane. The the, the service industry as a whole, we know, has been clobbered. Um, I mean, the best restaurants have been able to get back to has been limited indoor seating. Mm -hmm. um, and even if the pandemic stays with low infection rates, let's be honest, the cold weather is going to mm -hmm. take care of all the outdoor seating. Mm -hmm. um, and that's and people are just not going to be, you know, sitting outside on a picnic table in a January mm -hmm. snowstorm. Mm -hmm. As far as the hotels, the best they were able to do this summer, the best was probably get back to about 50% capacity. And as the tourism season's gone away, uh, the industry is already reporting huge contraction there. The chances of these industries rebounding quickly are slim to begin with. Mm -hmm. The chances of them rebounding without a transit system that can get people to work mm -hmm. um, might be too small to measure. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, politics. And I know that uh, none of you are um, other than Brandon. Um, I know that John Carl, you're not currently um, in the political world. And Keith, I know that you observe the political world and you cover it, but that you're not a, a political player. But let's talk a little bit about the potential for Connecticut to lose political clout. Is there a chance that Connecticut in the census is going to lose a congressional seat? Um, anybody want to speculate on that? Absolutely, that's a risk. Uh, we lost a congressional seat 10 years ago. Um, if you look at the population trends in the state, we're essentially at the same population level now than we were that we were about 50 years ago. In the meantime, you see growth in places like the Southwest or in Florida as people move to warmer climates. So yeah, all of those things, and they're compounded. That's compounded by an undercount. So we may be uh, fighting a difficult battle uh, population-wise anyway, mm -hmm. but if we're not counting the people who are here, uh, we do stand to lose another seat. So Connecticut, which 10 years ago had six congressional districts, mm -hmm. may have four in the future. Yeah, for sure. Brandon, um, 10 years ago, the redistricting that happened after the census um, ended up, uh, it's supposed to be in Connecticut handled by a bipartisan group. It ended up having to go to a special master because the uh, two sides became kind of deadlocked or what was going to happen. What could we anticipate coming mm -hmm. up? 
That's a really great question. Uh, and I think there are conversations being held as we speak. Um, 10 years ago, I wasn't here. Uh, however, um, I, I, my seat was created as a result mm -hmm. of redistricting uh, and Hartford losing a seat, uh, but gaining a seat, if you would, because I'm here and 60% um, uh, of my district is in Windsor. So, I mean, that's a really great question, but I, I, I could almost forecast and predict that there will be uh, some infighting um, on how that's determined. Mm -hmm. I want to take a couple of questions from the audience. I have uh, one question here uh, saying that many Puerto Ricans came to live in Connecticut and other states following the 2017 hurricane. Can the census data help us estimate the number of people displaced by natural disasters and how could that data be used? Now, I know there's been somewhat of an impact uh, because of that uh, migration from Puerto Rico after the ter terrible devastation on our schools, for instance. Brandon? And so, so what's the question there? I mean, I, I heard it's about how so many Puerto Ricans came to live in Connecticut and other states That's following right. the 2017 hurricane. So the census now this year could be dramatically different uh, because of that natural disaster in terms of the Puerto Rican population. Yeah. Well, I, I know um, on behalf of the Black and Puerto Rican Latino Hispanic Caucus, um, mm -hmm. that's not the official name, but I want to be very inclusive yes. and intentional. Uh, with uh, the various uh, diversity within that community. Um, I know many of the legislators who represent um, uh, pre predominantly Latino, Hispanic mm -hmm. communities uh, and are Latino and Hispanic themselves uh, have met with local nonprofits uh, to ensure number one, services are being met, but number two, uh, many of these families um, um, are able to better understand uh, the resources and the importance of the census um, as they continue to migrate here to uh, the state of Connecticut in particular. Uh, but there's going to be some challenging days ahead, um, as we've already discussed uh, throughout this conversation. Um, while many of these folks are American citizens, okay, uh, some of them still uh, fear uh, mistreatment uh, and, and there is sort of a hesitation um, around participating in any of uh, the federal government uh, programs, i.e. the census. Uh, so I do know that uh, with Representative Christopher Rosario serving as the co-chair on this particular effort, has done an outstanding job uh, putting in initiatives and programs to reach out to the Latino Hispanic community. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, you know, and I do recall uh, when I was uh, a member, I still am a member of the um, uh, State of Connecticut uh, Secretary of State's Civic Ambassadors Group. Um, one of the things that we heard a lot about was that um, there are a lot of Puerto Ricans in Connecticut who mm -hmm. would go back to Puerto Rico to vote. That's um, right. Wouldn't even vote in the district that they were living right. in. They would go back to Puerto Rico to vote because that's where they're. Right there. Yeah. That's so true. That's so true. And and I think it's just our responsibility as the elected officials uh, who have a bit more knowledge and maybe insight because of the seat that we sit in uh, mm -hmm. to inform many of our constituencies that, you know, you can vote here and yeah. you want to be uh, sure to vote for those folks who represent you right here in the mm -hmm. state. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's a really good point. Thanks mm -hmm. for sharing that, Diane. Keith, I think you had something you wanted to add. Yeah, I just wanted to throw out when, when we talk about can people afford uh, in this case, you were talking about one particular demographic group, but if people can afford housing, um, there's a study the United Way does periodically. It's known by its acronym, uh, ALICE, Asset Limited, Income Constrained and Employed. Yes. And they try to look at households and not just look at the federal poverty level, which says, you know, the federal poverty level uh, metric tries to say that a family of four could survive two adults and two young children on about $25,000 a year in Connecticut. Um, the Alice study tries to give you an idea of really what is the limit. A family like this could afford to stay in Connecticut and survive. They call it the survival budget. And they're saying it would take about $90,000. To give you some idea where I'm, where I'm going with this, 11% of Connecticut households are below the federal poverty level, but 38, almost 40% are below the Alice threshold. So, you know, I know you were asking particularly about the Puerto Rican community, but there are so many groups, so many people that are finding it hard to stay in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, and that's affecting our census numbers. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that Alice report also relies heavily on census data. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's definitely one of the things that's putting even our congressional seats at risk is there are too many parts of the state 
where people simply can't afford to live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, John Carlo, that gets back to what we were talking about before with uh, determining uh, nonprofits, determining where the need is, not where the business opportunity is, but where the need is. And because we have so much um, income disparity in this state, um, it, it strikes me that a lot of the nonprofits are clustering in certain areas because that's where the that's where the most dramatic need is. Maybe that's not always where they need to be. Maybe sometimes the census data may show that there's needs, and I suppose they already have the services, but way out in rural areas of the state where there also are, are a lot of needs and a lot of uh, uh, people living who are having difficulties. Yeah, I mean, Eastern Connecticut um, has some unique challenges and uh, in our state because of the distances between um, communities. And there, you were talking about transit earlier. Mm -hmm. People in Eastern Connecticut often uh, can't get to where the services are. Mm -hmm. So if there's not funding for transit and if transit isn't present, then they're not going to go and get, say, behavioral health services that they may need. Um, that, that is a problem in a, in a less densely populated area. Um, but we know also from census data, data that there are parts of Eastern Connecticut that have high levels of unemployment and high levels of poverty. So we are relatively anyway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we have to know where those needs are if we're going to know how we can get people to the services mm -hmm. um, that they depend on. Mm -hmm. um, we have an audience question from um, Don Rogers. If an accurate count is so important, what strategies are being adopted from the Federal Census Bureau down to the state and local government to reach the hard to count populations? Not sure if um, any of you have the answer to that, but if you do, I'd, I'd like to hear it. I don't know if I have an answer, but I'd like to make the problem worse if I could. Mm -hmm. Of course. Okay. That's what I do, Diane. I know. Um, no, uh, a lot of the strategies for outreach will hinge upon one uh, technology and the internet. And you'll see very quickly where I'm going with this. The pandemic has shown us we have a lot of households with big connectivity issues as in they can't afford it. They don't have devices. They don't have the internet access themselves. And we try to reach our poorer communities in school, but um, school's not always open these days, excuse me, school's not always open in person these days. And sometimes we try, actually try to get information out through care providers, but we have large segments of the population in Connecticut that don't have a regular relationship with a family doctor. The point I'm getting at is with because of the large income and wealth inequality in Connecticut, we have large segments of the population that are hard to reach with the census. And unfortunately, it doesn't take that many people not participating, pardon my double negative, to hurt you in the census area. Mm -hmm. So it's a good question and I'm not sure what the solution is. The pandemic's certainly making it harder, mm -hmm. but it's a problem I don't think Connecticut's fully solved yet. Yeah, I mean, uh, you may have seen uh, pictures of uh, uh, enumerators, as they're called, going door to door wearing PPE so that they can actually knock on people's doors and, and hope to count these people. But um, certainly the uh, the lack of Internet um, has really shown up with schools going uh, remote, whether it's higher education or um, or uh, middle school and grade school. It's, it's so dramatic. Um, I have another question here from the audience who wants to know, um, if you could add another question to the census, what would it be and why? That's that's clever. Uh, John Carl, I start with you. I think I would I would add a, a send a question that asks the, what kind of social services would be helpful to you uh, to reach the kind of goals that you have in your life. Mm -hmm. How about uh, Brandon? If you could add an extra question, what would it be? I'll, I'll go with what the previous uh, uh, panelists shared. Um, I haven't really thought through that. I think there are too many questions if you ask uh, ask me, but I, I think asking what type of services yeah. you might need. Yeah, uh, Keith, how about you? One. What else should we be asking in the census? Um, do you, uh, do you uh, consume news from at least two or three sources every day? And if not, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Only Keith. Only Somebody Keith. is asking here, um, is there a more effective way to collect accurate population data instead of having a census every 10 years? So I guess the question really from the audience is, is a census in any way outdated? Is there a better way to collect 
data. I mean, we do live in a, in a time of big data, that's for sure. And we're giving up a lot of that data every day on the internet, on our phones, on everything. Um, is there a better way? Could any of you anticipate that maybe the census is, is dated? The census is part of the U.S. Constitution, so unless that's changed, uh, we're going to be doing a census every 10 years. Now, what we can do is use technology the way uh, somebody's described uh, to kind of fill in the gaps as we go over the course of those 10 years. But that leads back to the issue that Keith had mentioned, which is not everybody has the technology that we just assume everyone has. Mm -hmm. uh, and, those, and those folks are going to continue to be undercounted if you rely on technological solutions. Mm -hmm. I was looking at a, a, an image on a, a newspaper today and I saw census enumerator actually going under a bridge to where there was a tent that a homeless person was um, staying in and collecting information from that homeless person. And I thought that really showed what kind of an effort this takes. Um, Brandon, I, I think that, you know, what John Carl was saying is so true. The, the technology plays such a big part in this for good and for bad, right, Brandon? I agree. I agree. I agree with you 100%. But until we uh, address the Constitution, I don't think there's much that we, we can do. Mm -hmm. um, I do know, though, and, and, and you all correct me uh, if I'm wrong, there is um, an electronic version of the census. I know I completed my census online. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think, I think we're ahead in that regard. But in terms of collecting data, that's a good point. Yeah, this was the highest um, ever. Uh, which I guess it makes sense since it's only every 10 years, highest ever right. online response. There's also phones and then there's a uh, phone response. You can call the census and you can also uh, mail in a response besides having somebody come and knock on your door. Um, Keith, I wanted to just, uh, before we end up wrapping up, I just wanted to ask you one question and that is something that um, Denise Merrill probably would have loved to have commented on if she hadn't had to leave uh, previously. But that is that um, we hear so much about Connecticut being a wealthy state, but the risk of every time there's a tax increase that pe the wealthy people in Connecticut are going to move out and then they're going to take all their money with them and then we're going to end up, you know, not being as wealthy as we were, not having people who are paying a large share of taxes. But the census data, does it show that that is really happening? I mean, we hear all the time about people leaving Connecticut, going to Florida, wherever. Thank you. You know, this is one of my favorite topics. Now, the, the, the census data blows an enormous hole in this myth. The problem is, even when it's out there, and I understand it, it's a very sensitive issue. Governor Lamont very much believes in the theory of wealth exodus. It's just the census data does simply does not support it. Um, you can look at probably the top 10 or 15 richest states in the nation, and with the exception of Hawaii, which has some enormous climate advantage, almost every single year, they lose some income due to migration. People from rich states, when they move, make their state less rich. Um, and, uh, you know, we were talking before about how you get very, very poor states like Arkansas, and they gain income, not overall, but through migration every single year, because when you're at the bottom, there's no place to go but up. But at the end of every year, Arkansas and Mississippi are still battling to rank 49th and 50th in just about every poverty metric you find. I mean, the census data shows that no matter what Connecticut does with its tax policy, for the most part, the people who move out of this state every year are going to be a little richer than the people who move in. But our overall wealth ranking doesn't change. In other words, states don't really get richer or poorer because of migration. They get they get richer or poorer, they become better off or worse off because of the economic decisions they make. They grow their millionaires, they don't import them. Hmm, interesting. Um, I think we're just about out of time. So I just wanted to give each of our panelists an opportunity to kind of make a, a closing statement. And uh, Brandon, I'm gonna start with you. Awesome. You know, first of all, thank you so much, Diane. Um, great uh, facilitation of uh, today's discussion. Um, and to both my my distinguished colleagues, uh, thank you for the work that you all you both do in your respective areas. Um, I'll end off with just please be counted. Um, I know we've been talking a lot about voting. That's important, but also be counted uh, and, and don't allow for the fear tactics that are being used to deter you from uh, being a part of the overall census. So uh, again, thank you this opportunity to share in. Well, thank, thank you for being with us. I know on a special session day, it's difficult, so we really appreciate your time. Um, you. John Carl, how about you? 
final statement? My final statement is if you live in Connecticut, it, uh, you will feel like a good person helping your state um, if you complete the census. If you're watching this and you don't uh, live in Connecticut, don't, don't do the census. It's, uh, it's a lot of hassle. <laughs> Thank you, John girl. And Keith, how about you? How am I supposed to follow that? I know. <laughs> um, it, I want to thank uh, Rebecca, the folks at the Old State House, uh, everybody on the panel, and and you, Diane. Um, the last thought I wanted to offer, I freely admit I want to credit UConn economist Fred Karstensen because I'm stealing one of his favorite sayings, and that is, Connecticut is a data desert that we could definitely be doing more at the state government level to record data, but more than anything else, we need to compile and analyze more data about this state. So if you fill out the census, it's like bringing water to sort of to Fred Carstensen if he were trapped in a desert. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I'm sure Fred will appreciate to be <laughs> being referenced in this conversation. Um, I want to thank all three of the panelists. I want to thank Secretary Merrill for joining us too, as well as uh, the Connecticut Democracy Center for planning this program and uh, bringing it to us via uh, Facebook Live and as well via uh, the Connecticut Network, CTN. And uh, Rebecca, I'm going to just close by asking people two major things to do this fall. Complete the census this week, if you can, and please register and vote. Rebecca, back to you. Thanks, Diane, and thanks to all of our panelists for a really interesting conversation. Um, we really appreciate all of you joining us at home. I wanted to just remind folks that this we have the third in our program series on the 2020 census, which is coming up on October the 14th, again at noon. And this uh, the third uh, program will be about controversies of the 2020 census, which we got a little bit of a preview uh, to at the start of this program. We'll be joined by Bridget Quinn Carey, the CEO of the Hartford Public Library, Chris George, the Executive Director of IRIS, and Dr. Bilal, excuse me, Dr. Bilhail Dabir Sekou, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science from the University of Hartford. And again, we're very pleased that we'll have the program moderated by Diane Smith. I'd like to also invite our audience to join us for a few more programs as well on October the 7th at 7 p.m. Please join us for the rise of the Latinx vote, the His, uh, Hispanic identity at the polls, which will be um, offered in conjunction with UConn's El Instituto, and it will be moderated by Professor Charles Venator Santiago of the UConn Department of Political Science. And the following day will be um, a dialogue program on October uh, excuse me, on October the 15th, which will be about from suffrage to election, which is a, uh, an encounters program that is co-sponsored with our friends at UConn Thomas Dodd uh, Center, as well as the Hartford Public Library and Wadsworth Athenaeum. If you need to get out from your houses, as we all sometimes feel like we do, we will be having a couple of on-site opportunities for you to join us here at Connecticut's Old State House. The farmer's market continues to take place on Tuesdays and Fridays from 10 to 2 p.m. And that will be through the end of October. This week, our very, very last uh, concert for the concert series will be uh, on uh, Friday at noon. And we hope you will join us uh, with the Blues Jazz Project. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. We've enjoyed having you. Look for this program to be on CTN and we'll see you next time.